Hi and welcome to A Select Star is Born or Why You Should Never Use Select Star in Production. My name is Ami Levin and I'm a database professional with many years of training experience. You can find out more about me in the links below. I hope you will find this training valuable and entertaining, so let's get started. This training was designed for people with minimal SQL experience, but even if you're a skilled SQL developer, don't go anywhere, you will most likely find this training valuable as well. By the end of this training, you will know what select star is used for, why you shouldn't use it in production, and how to write select list expressions to improve performance and avoid potential disasters. Note that while I will be using SQL Server and the AdventureWorks sample database for the demos, the same concepts apply to most relational database engines. Select lists are comprised of a comma-separated list of expressions, typically involving references to columns from the base tables, which are evaluated in the from clause of the query. For many queries, the expressions consist of the based columns directly without any additional operators, functions, or aliases. In these cases, SQL allows for a very convenient shortcut that saves us the need to type each column name individually, and instead we can use an asterisk, typically referred to by SQL developers as star. You can use just a star as a select list expression, which in turn evaluates to all columns from all source tables. SQL Server Management Studio can show you what column names will replace the star when the query is executed just by hovering the mouse over the star character. The same applies when the star is prefixed with a table alias, but in that case only the columns from the alias table will be used. So, if using select star results in shorter code, why shouldn't we use it in production? Well, obviously, if we don't do the work of evaluating the column names ourselves, the database engine will need to do some extra work to evaluate those for us. This may incur additional overhead, potentially hurting performance. However, System table access, which is used to get the column names, is typically ultra-fast and in most cases this overhead will be hardly measurable. That said, the relative overhead will increase for queries that are ultra-fast to begin with and may become significant if there are many queries which use select star that are executing concurrently. I have seen very few cases like that in real life, but they do exist. Much more serious is the fact that select star retrieves all columns indiscriminately, regardless if the client application uses them or not. I've witnessed numerous cases where select star was used as a coding practice, even though the client application rarely requires all columns from all underlying tables. Too often I hear SQL developers say, well, I just rather send everything back to the client and let it decide what it needs and what to ignore. This way, I rarely need to change the query when the client requirement change, and it's much easier for me to write. This may sound reasonable and harmless enough, unless you are aware of the huge impact this approach may have. Since retrieving excess data may incur unnecessary and very expensive disk I.O. to fetch, it can bloat valuable memory buffer space and increase network traffic. While these are hard to isolate and quantify, I have seen cases where it was stressing the server resources. Even worse is the fact that it prevents the query optimizer from using very efficient covering indexes to satisfy the query. A covering index is an index that contains all the data that the query needs, eliminating the need to access the base table. To learn more about covering indexes, see the links below. For example, the first query, which retrieves all rows and all columns from the sales order detail table, 
ordered by product ID takes about three minutes to complete on my laptop. If we look at the execution plan, we'll see that the optimizer chose to perform a full scan of the entire table and on top of that, a very expensive sort. But if the client only really needs product ID and sales order ID and not all columns, limiting the select list to just these two columns allows the optimizer to use a covering index. In this case, the index on product ID is used since it has all the data that the query needs, namely the product ID and the sales order ID columns, and it has it already sorted in the right order. This eliminates the need to access the base table and to sort by reading the rows directly from the index in order. Our optimized query now completes in about one second. But if performance is not enough to convince you to ditch the habit of using select star, how does breaking production code sound? This may happen later on when changes are made to the underlying tables. For example, let's say our client application uses a select star from sales order header even though it only really needs sales order ID and order date. Everything works fine until one day some unrelated change is made to the underlying table. For example, a new column is added. Now, the select star query will return more columns than the client expects, which typically results in an application error. However, a query that explicitly specifies just sales order ID and order date in the select list will be unaffected. Even worse, I have witnessed cases where a column was dropped and then another one was added, keeping the total number of columns the same as before, but obviously the ordinal position of the columns may have changed. So if the client code doesn't follow best practices and instead of referencing columns by name, it references them by ordinal position, it may now pick the wrong column for processing. This means that not only may we get errors because of this practice, the client may be processing wrong data without even raising an error. Now you have a much more serious mess to deal with. In one of the cases that I witnessed, it nearly caused the company to go bankrupt. I hope that by now you are convinced that even though it may be tempting to send some effort and use select star, the potential implications may be disastrous. While select star is great for experimenting with code in early development stages, exercising, or for proof of concepts, I use it extensively for my training that I even got my car a custom license plate to match. Even though select star has its place in your toolbox, you should never use it in a production environment. Instead, you should take the time to thoroughly investigate what is the minimal set of columns that the client needs and explicitly write it down in the select list. This will avoid all the challenges we just mentioned. Doing so will save your organization and you from some potentially pretty nasty situations, ranging from very bad performance, application errors, and even worse, potential data loss or corruption. So, what did we learn today? We saw the syntax of select star and how it is used or abused. We realized that although the database engine will need to do some extra work to evaluate the column names, in most cases, the performance impact will be negligible. We saw a live example of how limiting the select list to the minimal number of required columns make a query go from three minutes to one second, and how select star may cause errors or even data corruption when subsequent changes are made to the underlying tables. This concludes this training. 
I hope you enjoyed it and that from now on when you see someone about to commit a query with Select Start to Production, you will stop them dead in their tracks and either explain the reasons why it is such a potential disaster or refer them to this training video. Thank you very much for your time and I hope to see you in our next SQL training. Bye-bye!